So good morning, everybody. I'm live from Darmstadt in Germany, and I would like to talk to you about how we use machine learning in operations. So the agenda that I put together is I'd like to talk about anomaly detection, diagnostics, and prediction. So I understood that this conference goes more in the direction of intelligent management. So why, that's the reason why I go deeper in anomaly detection. And then for diagnostic and prediction, I tell you a bit, but it's a bit more superficial due to time constraints. So anomaly detection. The, in, in the background that we use anomaly detection is space operations. So one of the, our major clients, clients is the European Space Agency. And this is what you see is the control center. And there you manage uh, satellites, so it's remote uh, management and control. And the data looks something like this. So we have uh, mostly time series, different sampling rate, but the typical spacecraft has between 20,000 and 40,000 sensors, which is colossal telemetry parameters. For anomaly detection, I would like to tell you about what are the challenges that we are experiencing, what is the classical approach, and also what are our approach and some magic sauce that maybe if you don't have this sort of magic, it doesn't work for you. So the first thing is, what is an anomaly? And uh, we've seen in the presentation before, it's hard to tell. Some people say it's like uh, something that is not respecting the specifications of uh, this as it was built for. But at space operation, we have a working definition of what is an anomaly. And this is our definition. We didn't want this to happen. And this applies like, 95% of the cases that we hear the word anomaly in this context. For completeness, the other 5% is we wanted this to happen, but it didn't. So a challenge uh, from the software point of view or from machine learning point of view is that for us, it's hard to understand what is it that you wanted to happen or not to happen. So we change slightly the problem. So instead of trying to do Anomaly detection, what we do is novelty detection, okay? And novelty detection is finding what is unusual in our data, because what we found is that more often than not, an unusual behavior is often the signature of an anomaly in the way to happen. The other challenge we experience in space operations is that we face mostly all the time, first time anomalies. So the spacecraft are built for a, with a time life uh, in mind, maybe three, five years. But then what happened is that the satellite is well behaved and we continue using it for 10 years, 15 years. So we know that something will break eventually, but we don't know what, where, and which subsistence or, or when, but something will break because we are using much longer than it was uh, designed for. So the first, Time that anomalies happen are the worst because nobody thought that this anomaly was even possible. And, and this is the, the most useful for us. So this is our goal to detect these first time anomalies. And it's always first time because once the engineers understand why this anomaly happened, they operate the satellite in a different way so that the, that the anomaly doesn't happen again. So we are really focused on first time anomalies. The other thing that uh, I'm sure everyone here is aware of is false alarms. So engineers hate false alarms because it takes a lot of time to investigate the alarms. And if you have a system that provides many false alarms, engineers will ignore altogether uh, the result of an anomaly detection. So we really want to be sure that what we give them doesn't contain false alarms. An example to make the point, imagine that we have a system that is right 99% of the time. This, in our case, will be a very bad uh, system because it means that 1% of the time will be wrong. And if we have 40,000 parameters, it means that every day we give in the engineers 400 alarms to investigate, which are false, so it's, it's terrible. 
And the other thing is that operators, they need to clearly understand why it's anomalous. If you give some data and it's not immediately obvious to them why this was anomaly, they, they will lack confidence, there is lack of confidence in the results and they will stop using it. So I jump to how is the classical approach in space control system, there is something called out of limits. And as you see, you have some data, you define soft limits, hard limits, and every time a signal goes below, above the soft limits or hard limits, the engineers, they get uh, an alarm in the mission control system. I mean, this has many limitations because not every parameter has these limits. Uh, something can be anomalous even with this, if it is in limit and it takes time to, to adjust. Also, as the satellite degrades, these limits change. So it's, it's not uh, like a good approach. And now I jump to our approach, how we do it. So what we, we tried many different things and what we found it worked well is actually very simple. So we have our data time series. We do this for each of the time series and we divide it in, in time periods and we compute statistical measurement, very simple, like mean standard deviation, maximum and minimum. The duration of the time periods that we use are like one day because the statistics become more stable and it has a natural cycle in the way that uh, the emissions are operated because at the end there's operation by people and then they follow some of the uh, periodicity. And what we do with that? I mean, for a second example, I'm putting here only two dimensions and the two dimensions I'm putting are standard deviation and, and mean. And let's say that you have on the left some points and everything is nominal here. And on the right, everything is nominal. So where this point come from? So we ask engineers, tell us examples of time periods when everything was nominal. And they tell us, for instance, from January to March, uh, everything was fine. So we put this data there. And uh, this on the left maybe could correspond to a working mode. This is the different working mode. And the typical thing in our layer detection is that if you have one point, let's say today is this point, so well, it's very far away. So I declare this as, as something to be investigated. This approach will generate many false alarms and we are not happy with that. To make the point, I have put another on the right, exactly the same distance. And in this case of the left, we say that this is worthwhile to investigate. Here on the right is the wall, it's just fine. So whatever threshold we put here will be totally arbitrary and uh, will generate many false alarms. Uh, if you realize the intuition why it works on the left is that when data is similar, is very similar. So you see in this area, is all very similar. And here on the right is very dispersed. And then you can allow more distance that is going to be a problem. So where, what happened is that we want to capture this intuition of density. And that's why we use a density based earlier detection. And we use uh, an approach from a, is that is called localized probabilities. And what we like about this approach is that it makes no assumptions how the nominal behavior should be. So sometimes if you require like a Gaussian distribution, our data is not Gaussian at all, so it's all fine. It takes into account that the parameter can have different working modes, which is in our case, so you can have data all over the place. Take into account the density. This is uh, very good for us in the sense that we don't need to specify a threshold. And uh, what we get is probabilities and probabilities for us is fundamental because it allows us to compare. So at the end, we want to give a flight control engineers a uh, system of what are the parameter parameters that I need to check. And we can compare probabilities. Otherwise, we could not compare like current with voltages with the velocities, temperature. But like this, we can compare how unusual the behavior are. So some magic sauce. And um, yes, here I need to say that the density of the estimation is computed with uh, some neighbors and so on. And it's used, uh, you can make an analogy with the k-nearest neighbor. So, to reduce the false alarms, we realize that this K to compute the density is arbitrary. So you can have five, 10, 20, 30. What we do is we compute all of them and we say, if something is to be declared as unusual, 
it has to be unusual regardless which uh, number of neighbors we use to compute the density. So like this, we gain confidence that is uh, really anomalous before we show to the engineers. And the other thing we have is a proximity filter. So sometimes what happens is that data is very constant. So for instance, when you measure the voltages of, of the battery is five volts, five, 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 five. And one day is 495. Since most of the time was five, the density is almost infinite. So people will not find obvious that you have an anomaly or all the reasons. That's why we put like a filter around and not to, to consider these anomalies. And we show the result like this. So we have a web interface and people can really see out of the 40,000 parameters, which three parameters are the most uh, unusual today. And let me put you some example. This is a, I mean, this is quite simple. And one day, this is a correspond to a thermistor couple. So you have the temperature going up and down because you know in the spacecraft, you need to have the temperature in a, in a range for, for uh, it's like in the car, so where you have the air conditioning, you know, in the working temperature. This has been working fine for 10 years and nobody was checking. And one day we have here the out of limits. And of course, you see that this is going down, down, down. And our novelty detection system uh, detected it here. And if you realize mm, this is, uh, you can have plenty of ideas on how to do this simpler. The thing is that we have something that works for everything. I like particularly this example because it shows that two months in advance, you can detect the anomaly and for something that the out of limit will not work. Maybe something more catchy is anomaly detection in the International Space Station. So, you know, uh, we have this ATV, the automated transfer vehicle that brings to the International Space Station oxygen and food and so water to the astronauts. And inside this automated transfer vehicle, there is a fan. And this fan is important because it mixes the oxygen. We human beings, we cannot breathe pure oxygen, otherwise we will die. So this uh, fan broke and they asked us uh, if we could have detected this and we run the data through and said, yeah, sure, we could have detected. But the interesting thing is that we also discovered that one week before it failed, there were unusual concentrations of particles in the smoke detectors. And this is like a signature of the fan not working properly. And so this, uh, we found a way to understand that the fan will break by monitoring the, the smoke sensor. So this, you can discover an intended sensor, let's say. For diagnostics, uh, some example I can put is uh, Another problem we have is once people already know that there is an anomaly, they want to investigate why the anomaly happened. And since uh, I'm more for the data science point of view, we wanted to check if other parameters can, can have this key to understand this problem. And we make an assumption. Our assumption is if a parameter is to be involved in this anomaly, it will behave in a different way during nominal periods and anomaly periods. And this, is, this information is something that we have already. People know when the anomaly happened and there is plenty of times when the anomaly didn't happen. So we do something like this. Uh, we uh, define something called target periods, where it's period of interest when the anomaly happened, nominal periods when the anomaly didn't happen, and what we do is we check for different statistical features and find if these statistics are similar during target periods and during nominal and very different during nominal periods. And the output you get is like this. So we find other parameters which at the same time are involved in the anomaly. To the engineers, it looks like we are finding which are the parameters who have something to do with the anomaly. In reality, what we're doing is the other way around, is that we are discarding the parameter that we are sure that has nothing to do. And what is left is what we present to them. I mean, there are some examples that, uh, I mean, maybe this is long to, to explain. This is a bit easy to, easier to, to explain in the sense that uh, when there is a solar flare, 
you can understand which parameters are automatically affected by radiation. And I go a bit quickly because uh, I want to show something also. It's something we're trying to do, find the dependencies from data automatically. And we build this based on the behavior of data. And this allows us to understand the dependencies, not from the model, not from the simulator, but from the data itself. And yes, we have papers on this, uh, but uh, time is short to, to explain how it works. And I want to give you an overview uh, of some example of uh, things we're doing for prediction. And for instance, we are predicting the thermal power consumption in Mars. And this is important because uh, the, I don't know how many of you know, but before launching the Mars Express spacecraft to Mars, somebody forgot to plug some cables on the solar array. And Mars Express is getting 70% of the power that it should be getting. So, uh, I mean, we need to live with that. The thing is that we would like to do as much science as possible without uh, endanger the satellite because of lack of power. So we need to predict how much power it will be consumed to keep the satellite warm. And whatever is left, we can use for science. So we launched uh, together with ESA a machine learning competition and was very successful. And we got very good results. Uh, similar to this, another issue we are facing, facing in prediction is predict what is the risk of ESA satellite colliding with space debris. Again, we launched a competition, results quite interesting. Uh, very useful as well is uh, we have uh, radiation belts that protect us from radiation, which is very good. The problem is for satellite is as they cross these radiation belts, there are some particles that get trapped, like a charged electron, charged proton and so on. And what happened is that we need to protect spacecraft so that they are not damaged. If we will know when they will be crossing the radiation belt, because it's also breathing a bit, uh, we can maximize the science return. So this is what we're doing. We're predicting when the satellite will be crossing this radiation belt using machine learning. Another interesting project is we're predicting how the wind will impact the pointing in deep space antenna. These space antenna are very large. This is a 35 meter dish for comparison on the left here. You see a person and it's particularly in, in Argentina, in Malawi. What you see the mountains here are the Andes and being so close to the mountains happen that sometimes we have strong, uh, sorry, strong wind and this wind can affect the pointing. And for satellites which are very far away, like in Mars or Mercury or so, the pointing needs to be really, really precise in the order of milli degrees of the one we're looking. So by predicting how the wind impacts the pointing, we can compensate and have uh, an interrupted link. Something uh, also more fancy is that sometimes we do text mining as well. And this project we did for ESA is predicting which kind of article will receive a high number of views even before publishing. And it's interesting. What we found is when we talk about Rosetta Comet, uh, no image, uh, crater, Mars, black holes, it's like immediate success. When we talk about ESA company technologies, nobody cares too much about it. But it's a, you know, some lesson learned. So with this, I'm, thinking, uh, I'm checking the time. Uh, let's take in touch. So you can connect me, LinkedIn, write me an email. There you find it. I understand from Olga that question we have at the end. So we'll meet you there. Thank you very much. Um, I think we are a bit uh, ahead of time. Um, so either we can we can ask um, we can ask question. I mean, answer question now. Or maybe it's better to 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 wait until until the the major discussion. I'm I'm looking quickly through the the questions that were posed. Um, no, I think at the moment there's not yet yet question in this direction. So I would propose we we then wait for the um, for the next speaker at uh, ten twenty five, and until that let's keep on mute.